hello and welcome to Modern Business Accounting Principles. Um, we are up to chapter 18, Labour Saving Devices and Machines. Now remembering this book is from 1936, uh, copyright Alexander Hamilton Institute. This chapter really is the first time that the book's age has been demonstrated. Um, there's been talk of um, uh, officers, of bookkeepers, all doing their thing and uh, there's been talk of um, pounds for Australia which has been fun and very much a focus on the businessman but really in this chapter we will actually see just how far accounting processes if not accounting principles have come since the book was published. So chapter 18 labour saving devices and machines. The point has been stressed in earlier chapters of this text that the accounting process and systems should be fitted to the individual needs of an organisation. And that's true, as true today as it was when the book was published. Accurate information promptly prepared from the books or records is expected from a good system. And this may be obtained in several different ways. Books may be added or omitted, forms may be varied, ledgers and journals may be combined in a single form or one may be split up into subsidiary units. As long as the resulting system serves its purpose and presents the necessary information. Still exactly true. So even if you need specific things or you have particulars in your business that need to be recorded, eventually it becomes um, the result of necessary information. The ideal accounting system is one in which the maximum of information is obtained with the minimum of expense. And by expense, in this book, a modern um, business organisation would have been paying bookkeepers. So it's also a minimum of time. So you don't want to be spending heaps of time to prepare unnecessary information. Accounting practice has been developing rapidly in the past few years. It was not so very long ago that business concerns used the old conventional journals and ledgers. It's not so long ago that we were using paper records. But these new pieces of equipment and even newer methods are being devised. So the first fundamental shift in accounting that the book goes into are loose leaf records. So not many years ago all bookkeeping records were kept in bound books as these were about the only type of equipment available. It was considered to be a radical procedure for a concern to introduce loose leaf books for the principal accounting records. There has been so much progress, however, that practically every office of any size includes this type of equipment in its system to some extent. So a loose leaf is just talking about loose pieces of paper that are then entered and um, like collected into a book or which probably call a folder. This particular feature that has brought loose leaf records into general use is their flexibility. Organisations that employ several bookkeepers are able to split up this form of record in such a way that several stages of the work can be carried on simultaneously. Imagine how life changing it would be to be going from one book that only one person could work in at one time to pieces of paper that could be collected. Oh, furthermore, the low sleeve ledger eliminates many of the vexing questions of paging, the carrying forward of balances, the dropping of inactive accounts and the introduction of new accounts. It is necessary only to open the ledger at the proper place and insert a new sheet to introduce a new account in the desired location or to carry forward an old account. So in the old books, literally pages were nominated for particular accounts. So if you had um, an one account that was underactive or not used very often, and then on the page before it, you had an account that was used a lot, like one page would be basically empty and another page would be overflowing. It's possible to combine several different books under one binder simply by inserting division tabs or using various coloured sheets to distinguish one section from another. Radical. Absolutely radical. In some organisations, for example, the debtors and creditors ledgers are kept in the same binder with the general ledger, even though the control accounts are maintained in the general ledgers to cover the balances in the subsidiary ledgers. Just, just whew, radical. A further adaptation of the low sleeve device is found in the card ledger. Cards may be kept in filing cabinets in such a way as to make the records still more flexible than the low sleeve books. 
This is particularly convenient in keeping the debtor's ledger and if frequent reference is made to the accounts for correspondence purposes, it is simply a matter to extract the cards from the files. The transfer of cards, however, involves the danger of having the accounts lost or being out of the files at the time when they are needed for posting of additional entries. So it's radical but still has its limitations because what happens if somebody else has the card? And the main objection really as it, it goes into when loose leaf or cards were in, introduced was their security and legality as evidence in case of lawsuits. The fact that leaves were loose and could easily be removed appeared to increase the risk of loss or theft. Dishonest employees could substitute a new sheet and cover up a de-falsification. Experience has shown, however, that these objections are not well founded. It is not a simple matter to alter one record without affecting the entries in several other books. And that's very true in that way of doing work. The bookkeeping work is usually divided among several employees in such a way that it would be necessary for more than one to be implicated in any act involving a distortion of the accounts. So also they overcame the issues of um, legality with loose leaf records were recognised as evidence because the mere fact that a book has a permanent binding is not a guarantee against fraudulent entries. If care has been taken to arrange the bookkeeping work in such a way it will be extremely difficult to alter records without being detected. Also then it goes on to say that we need proper safeguards. So if proper safeguards have been placed upon the routine of office procedure, the entries in one form of book are just as authentic as those in another. So if you do find an issue with one, say one piece of paper goes missing, you actually have a backup record in another book. So in, it, in any large office, it's impossible for an executive to examine in detail the work of every office employee. The volume of transactions that must be recorded is so large that it is, it, it is inadvisable even to attempt a thorough audit of all entries. Now, that's something that's not probably that true anymore. Um, not in the manual sense. You're not going to manually analyse every transaction that somebody has made. But you can have software that looks for anomalies and that is the beauty of software and um, checking and cross-checking and cross-referencing if you get to that sort of level of um, accounting and finance. But the book continues on about uh, the importance of systems and internal checking and I think this is something that is relevant to small businesses that you should have ways to check what's happening in your bookkeeping. So let's say you process all your income through a PayPal account, then when you're doing your bookkeeping, um, a cross-check would be to cross-check the amount of income shown in your PayPal account against the amount of income shown in your WIV account, if you're using WAVE or if you're using any um, bookkeeping software. And then as an alt uh, if you're processing all your expenses through a particular bank account, a cross-check would be to go uh, download your bank statement and get all the outgoings and cross-check those against what your expenses have recorded in your bookkeeping software as your total expenses. So you need to find ways to cross-check information, particularly because uh, if you're a sole trader, it's just you. So if you make a mistake, you're not actually necessarily going to realise there is a mistake. You forgot an expense or you double counted some income like you need to be finding ways to check that information and that's your internal um, check finding ways actually to cross reference the information in your bookkeeping now how often are you going to do that you're probably not going to do that every time you do your bookkeeping because that might be too um, onerous but if you do weekly bookkeeping maybe you do it monthly if you do monthly bookkeeping maybe you do it quarterly like a bank reconciliation is a good one but it is actually fairly um, limited if you have your bank account linked to your bookkeeping software because if you're relying on that as the source of transactions you're not going to be picking up anything that came in or out that didn't go through your bank account so you need to think about all the places that money is flowing into your business cross check those and all the places money is flowing out of your business and cross check those because we're doing basically what the next section is which is checking for inaccuracies 
As a result of the introduction of labour-saving devices, the work of the bookkeeper becomes almost automatic. It practically introduces the system of a production line in the office so that each operative performs some one small task over and over again. The monotony of the work and the interruptions that frequently occur in the course of the day's work are likely to lead to errors in operation. And again, like that could have been written last week, like within slightly different context rather than 80 something years ago. Um, a complete check may be made when such inaccuracies arise. So if you do find a discrepancy between your bank balance or bank statement and your bookkeeping software, it's only then you're going to go back through those records and look for transactions and you start with something that's around the amount. So if you've got a $97.36 discrepancy, you're going to look for something that's about that amount. Like don't, it's not necessarily going to be exact because there may be some rounding or GST or some small transaction that occurred that you've not picked up like bank interest or uh, a PayPal fee, something like that. But you're going to start with something around that amount. And if you can't find something around that amount, you're then going to have to go through transactions in more detail because it's potentially a couple of transactions uh, that have been combined to that total or a, a transposition error combined with a small discrepancy. Um, back when we were looking at labour saving devices in 1936, they introduced a self-proving trial balance. But we're not going to get into that and we're not going to get into verification of balances, but we're going to look at office appliances in accounting work. So various types of appliances and machines have been introduced into accounting practice. Many machines have been designed to relieve the bookkeeper of routine work. In this respect, the development of office methods has followed the introduction of max methods in the factory. Every time a particular every time a particular operation becomes completely standardized, somebody produces an appliance that will do the work more cheaply and efficiently. That's still so true today. Every time an operation becomes standardized, somebody tries or will produce an appliance that does the work without the need for human labour. There is a constant march of machinery to take the place of human labour. Like this was 1936. This book in that way was quite progressive. It would be impossible to describe in detail all the machines that are at present being used in accounting practice. There are literally hundreds of patented devices that have applications to various phases of accounting work. Some concerns have been so completely mechanised their office work that none of the standard forms of record is retained. But it goes on to say, which is still true, it takes time to develop a system that utilises all the labour saving devices. And it's not just labour saving devices, like you have to think about learning the process, learning the device, learning the software these days and that does take time that's not something that's instant so there's a dedication that has to happen here we then have bookkeeping machines um, adding machines have been used for many years they were originally used for the purpose of saving time in the routine process of securing column totals in recent years however the companies that manufacture adding machines have introduced features that make them adaptable to actual bookkeeping operations They added totalizers, special keys with reference symptom, symbols, and in some cases, typewriter attachments have been introduced. The result being practically a combined adding machine and typewriter. Just imagine. Just imagine that an operator could both type and add. Um, competition is very keen and special adaptations are available for businesses with the right budget. Then there are posting and billing by machine, um, combining statements, uh, there are bank bookkeeping machines, whatever they may be, registering machines, cash registers have been used in stores and offices for a great many years for the purpose of keeping a definite check on the receipt and disbursement of cash. 
In recent years, these devices have been developed into elaborate accounting machines. This has been accomplished by adding special keys and totalizers that may be used to record information on transactions other than those that merely involve cash. Imagine recording everything other than those that involve cash. I remember when I worked in retail back in the hmm, late 1990s and the height, well, mid-1990s, the height of that period was a cash register that printed checks. So you put the check into the cash register printer, it printed the check and then the customer just needed to sign the check. But I'm going to say cash registers, checks, cash, credit card payments, all that. We did have credit card payments in 1990, don't get me wrong. Um, having one register where you record all your sales in a single place is such a time saver. And I recommend uh, if you do it in either PayPal or Square. So if you're using a Square, like I use a Square at Markets, I put all my sales into Square. I don't just put the card transactions into Square. I put the cash transactions into Square. So I have that accurate running total of what my sales were for the day. And I have a full course on how to use Square and how to actually make the most of the functionality that I'll pop a link to in here. Then we go back, let's go back to the book. We have tabulating machines, which are perhaps the most important recent development in labor saving devices, but I've never heard or seen a tabulating machine. But I think it's something like a punch card system because this, this is the example which would confuse the uh, computer generation. Then there's a sorting machine a printing tabulator as well as the normal tabulator apparently they're different things but after all these labor saving devices let's just have a quick summary it has been possible in this chapter to describe only a few of the innumerable, innumerable labor saving devices employed in accounting offices today a modern large office has the appearance of a machine room instead of long rows of bookkeepers perched up on high stools making entries laboriously by pen and ink. Pen and ink? Like they were separate things. One sees a room full of machinery of various kinds with a few operators. These new devices enable a concern to get its bookkeeping work done more accurately than ever before and at a much lower cost. With all of these mechanical aids, it is especially important for the accountant to understand the fundamental principles of accounting. This is actually really important. Machinery can be used to do the routine work of an office, but it cannot do the thinking for the executives. And we still aren't there. We're still not with AI, artificial intelligence. There must be someone in every organisation, and if you're a sole trader, there's only you who understands thoroughly all the processes and who can direct the work efficiently. Now I say when you're talking about directing work efficiently, it's not just the accounting work or the bookkeeping work, but also the work of the business and using the information that comes from accounting to direct that work. That is today's chapter. Next video, we're gonna cover proprietorship uh, or ownership or owner's equity. Um, if you have enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate a like, comment, or you can hit the subscribe for more videos like this. And until then, I'll see you next week.